according to Islam's most trusted sources, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, had sex with a nine-year-old girl. Uh, he married her when she was six or seven. He consummated the marriage when she was nine. Muhammad's marriage to a six-year-old girl is one topic that has driven many people from Islam. He really did it. And that is a real problem for Muslims. Muhammad was a pedophile. Muhammad was a pedophile. Muhammad was a pedophile. According to the latest historical critical scholarship, these reports are not true. We therefore should put to rest this idea that the Prophet Muhammad was a pedophile or that he married a child. Welcome to The Impactful Scholar. I'm your host, Dr. Javad T. Hashmi. Today, we're going to start out with a bang and talk about one of the most controversial hadiths out there, the hadith attributed to Aisha, the Prophet's wife, that claims that she was six years old when she was engaged to him and nine years old when she was married. This is, of course, used all over the internet by Islamophobes like David Wood to claim that the Prophet was some sort of pedophile. So this gets a lot of mileage by anti-Muslim critics. Now, to be fair, it's also used by some Islamic fundamentalists to justify child marriage. In truth, child marriage is rare across most of the Islamic world. According to statistics, the majority of child marriages take place in India and Sub-Saharan Africa. There's no direct causal link to Islam as such. It seems to be more cultural. For example, in India, like some 84% of child marriages are done in Hindu families, with some 11 or so percent with Muslims. Uh, which shows that it's not really about religion as such, but more about culture. Um, but in any case, it is still true that sometimes Islamic fundamentalists will use this hadith to claim, look, if the Prophet did it, then it's okay for everyone else. Now, I would say many Muslims, of course, deny that Aisha was six or nine years old when she was engaged and married, but Islamophobes will push back and say, no, that's just apologia. And even some academics will sometimes perceive it that way. I'm going to give you the latest historical critical scholarship, which was actually just uh, submitted at Oxford University by Dr. Joshua Little, who successfully defended his dissertation on this very subject. So uh, we're going to take a look at his work, which shows definitively that the hadith that's attributed to Aisha is not historically reliable, and that in fact it's a fabrication uh, of the 8th century in the Iraqi city of Kufa, meaning that's about a century and a half after the events that it supposedly describes uh, and almost like a thousand miles or so from the city in which it supposedly happened. In other words, there's no real reason for a critical historian to take this source as historically reliable. Okay. Now, I am a PhD candidate in Islamic studies at Harvard University, so I'm not an alim trained in a traditional Islamic seminary, but rather a, a Western historical critical scholar. So for me, these findings are highly relevant, but I do think that they're going to be relevant to many Muslims who are also interested in what historians have to say about the traditional Islamic sources, especially as it relates to this issue. In fact, Muslim reformists have argued for a very long time that Aisha was not nine years old when she was married and that she was likely much older than that. These results from Joshua Little's Oxford dissertation are definitely reinforcing that viewpoint. So from that standpoint, it's welcome news. Now, Joshua Little uses what's called the historical critical method. That's more of an approach to the sources that's critical. And he uses something called the Isnad Kam Mutton analysis, or ICMA, which is a methodology of evaluating hadiths, not only the content of the hadith, but also the chain of transmitters to determine, you know, where we think this hadith may have or originated from. And once he does this, and he honestly refines the methodology, advances hadith studies from that perspective, he determines his you know, conclusion is that it was originated or fabricated. That's, those are the words that he used. He says it was fabricated whole cloth, in fact, by Hisham ibn Urwa in the 8th century in Iraq. That was when he moved from Medina to Iraq, to the city of Kufa. And that's when he forged uh, or fabricated this hadith. Thereafter, it became, you know, very prevalent, and then it was then it's found in many classical Islamic sources. But what he notices is that this report is absent from some key legal and uh, biographical sources in the early period, especially in these Medinan sources, in which you would expect this report to be found if it indeed was historical. So, for example, he notes that 
It's not uh, in uh, Imam Malik's Al Muwatta. It's not in Al Mudawana. Um, and these are some texts in which you would really expect this sort of report to be in. Whether or not the author or the compiler considered it reliable or not, that report's not even found in those. There's just complete silence. One thing that I like about Joshua Little's dissertation is that he does defend the so-called argument from silence. And so um, I think from that standpoint, Joshua Little's uh, dissertation is a useful intervention. Um, it's not out yet publicly, I don't think, but it's, uh, you know, it's really hot off the presses. I was able to read the whole dissertation um, and I just found it absolutely uh, fantastic. In any case, he uses other methodologies as well uh, or other approaches, not only ICMA, as we discussed, but also other form critical, geographical, uh, and historical critical analyses. And all of these converge on the fact that this hadith was fabricated. And then he also speaks about how Aisha was almost certainly not six or nine years old um, at the time that she was engaged or married. First of all, he talks about how the sources are wildly confl conflicting when it comes to Aisha's age. Um, so you'll find, for example, that she was six or six or seven, nine, ten, even other numbers. If you try to historically reconstruct when Aisha was uh, engaged or married, you can come to all sorts of different results. Now, Joshua Little is critical of such historical reconstructions. There are some Muslims who have argued for these historical reconstructions and said Aisha was much older than uh, nine years old. Now, Dr. Little is critical of these reconstructions because he argues that the sources are wildly conflicting. And so you could really come up with almost any number looking at the sources. But I actually think that that's a point in favor of the skeptical uh, attitude towards this hadith in particular. It just is another data point that we can't rely on this specific hadith to say what age Aisha was or the traditional sources in general. As Western historians have been well aware of for a long time now, when it comes to chronology, uh, the traditional Islamic sources, that's one of their weaker points where they're quite inconsistent. And often numbers are chosen not for historically accurate reasons, but because they may serve some other purpose, a symbolic purpose. So for example, the Prophet Muhammad is said to have received his revelation and started his prophethood at the age of 40. Why 40? Because 40 is or was an important number in Near Eastern societies. That's when you reached your peak level of maturity. And so you see that number 40 quite frequently. Also, you see that certain dates are always chosen. Days are always chosen. Key events always happen on a Monday, for example. These kind of things. The other thing is you can even look at the age of or the alleged age of uh, the Prophet's wife, Khadija, the first wife. Um, she's said to have been 40 years old, but we know that she had several pregnancies and deliveries after, uh, you know, and there's a debate about how many children she had, which again tells you about the historical sources that we can't just take them uncritically um, and that there's a, a level of inconsistency in them. But the point is that she almost certainly wasn't 40 years old because how did she have so many pregnancies? We're talking up to eight pregnancies afterward or eight deliveries. That, that's just not realistic if she was 40 years old. I argue actually is that these numbers are chosen for symbolic reasons. So you, the number 40 was chosen for Khadija. Again, she, they were trying to stress her seniority and her maturity at the time of marriage. So they, they picked a high number for that. When it comes to Aisha, they were going in the reverse direction and they were stressing her youth. Now, Dr. Little in his dissertation explains why it is that they fabricated this in the first place and why did they want it to posit such an extremely young age? Well, it was done for sectarian propagandistic reasons. So basically, you know, as most of you know, in early Islam, there was a rivalry between what we can call proto-Sunnis on the one hand and proto-Shias on the other. The proto-Shias or the partisans of Ali were stressing their lineage and connection to Ali, um, who is the first Imam according to the Shias and the fourth caliph according to Sunni, Islam, for the fourth rightly guided caliph according to the Sunnis. So they were claiming, claiming their lineage through him and that was a source of a political claim to power, that you are coming from the Prophet's household and that your lineage is from the Prophet's household. Uh, entire caliphates were based on such presumptions. Um, similarly, you had others who were using their rival lineages. And in this case, there were people who were claiming their lineage through the Prophet's wife, Aisha. Um, and so they also wanted to stress that Aisha was, according to them, the Prophet's favorite wife. 
and that she was unique compared to the other wives of the Prophet because she was his only virgin wife. So the vast majority of the Prophet's other wives, according to the sources at least, were widows or divorcees. What made Aisha different, they argued, is that she was his only virgin wife, and in order to stress her virginity, they said that she was married at this extremely young age to preclude the idea that she could have had any other relationships before, before this. Virginity at that time was extremely prized. That's why, for example, Mary's age is said to be young, and you call her the Virgin Mary. Virginity is tied to purity, purity from sin, from carnal sin. So by positing an extremely young age, these proto -Sun, this group of proto-Sunnis is trying to stress the virginal purity of Aisha and thereby claim their lineage through the Prophet's favorite wife and claim that this is a, uh, and use this for claims to power. Um, and uh, the other point I, w I would make, Dr. Little doesn't make this, but I think this just reinforces his argument, is that I think, uh, again, in competition with the Alids or the partisans of Ali, uh, these people wanted to also put Aisha in the Prophet's household at a young age. So it's said, according to the traditional sources, that Ali entered into the Prophet's household at a very young age. So similarly, they wanted to place Aisha in the Prophet's household at a very young age. And that's why they stress reports that Aisha got engaged when she was six, married when she was nine, that she was playing with dolls in his household, playing on swings, etc. And by the way, Dr. Little deals with these hadiths as well, and his negative assessment encompasses them as well. The bottom line is, there's absolutely no reason for historical critical scholars to take these reports as being historically accurate. They have clear sectarian and political purposes behind them, and so we need to understand them in that vein. There are some other good studies on this. Yasmin Amin's art, uh, book chapter is also very good. It's a little bit more holistic, that it attacks it from not only an academic side, but also from a faith-based perspective. She points out something really important, which is that this hadith is not even a hadith to begin with. And so she argues that even a Muslim traditionalist doesn't need to take this report as canonical. And what she means by that is the report actually goes back to Aisha. It doesn't stop, sorry, it doesn't go all the way back to Prophet Muhammad. So technically, in order for it to be a prophetic hadith, the chain of transmission has to go all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad. In this case, it only goes to a companion, and this the Prophet's wife, Aisha, and as such is not a prophetic hadith, it's really just a khabar, or a report. And so even though it's found in Sahih Bukhari, that doesn't mean that we should consider it canonical from that perspective. But even if you're going to take a traditionalist approach, um, a religious traditionalist approach, there are reasons to question this report. For example, Hisham ibn Urwa, who's in the chain of transmission, he was accused of senality. Uh, he was accused of being senile um, and unreliable, especially in his later years when he moved to Iraq. And that's when he generated this report. So that's one of the reasons why we should doubt this report. And also, like I said, it's not found in the earlier sources. He was also accused of something called tadlis, which is a type of academic dishonesty. At a minimum, it's academic sloppiness, but it could also be considered academic dishonesty. So there are reasons to, again, question this report, especially when it clashes with, um, or it's, you know, it shows... It's not, it doesn't show up in those early sources. I think there are reasons for even Muslim traditionalists to take this report with a grain of salt. And from that perspective, there is a Muslim, a traditionalist, a Hadith scholar, Salahuddin al-Idlibi, a Syrian Hadith scholar, specialist, who actually argues very reasonably that, and now he takes the report as actually going back to Aisha. I don't, as a historical critical scholar, but even if you take it as going back to Aisha, you could take Salah... Salahuddin al-Idlibi's viewpoint, which is that Aisha was just mistaken when she stated that her age was that young. Aisha, in any case, wouldn't have known what her age is. Now, that's shocking to many of us because we obviously all know our ages, but we're talking about 7th century Arabia, which is a preliterate tribal society, stateless society. They didn't have a bureaucracy, um, so you didn't have birth certificates. You didn't celebrate your birthdays. And, um, and Dr. Little, in his dissertation, even talks about uh, various, uh, he has, uh, he cites a bunch of studies that shows that even in today's world, there still exists certain societies like that, uh, certain tribal societies in which people actually don't know their ages. They, they've been interviewed and they don't know their ages. Um, in my own experience, having lived in Pakistan, I saw that this was the case in rural parts of Pakistan, as well as 
I worked in an urban slum in Pakistan in a shanty town. Um, I worked at a free clinic, and I actually used to log patients' ages. Um, and there was absolutely no consistency in their ages. Actually, it was funny. Women would often go down in age as we would see them from year to year. Meanwhile, I, I you know, I once saw a woman. I mean, she was almost certainly in her early twenties. She claimed that she was sixteen years old. Um, again, they're just guessing at their age, and oftentimes it has a symbolic value. If you were the youngest sibling in your family, then you would stress a younger age. Um, if you felt more mature, you'd stress an older age. So. Uh, that's why Dr. Little argues, and I agree with him, that Aisha wouldn't have known her age. And whoever originated or fabricated this hadith, in this case we think it's Hisham ibn Urwa in the 8th century, he wouldn't have known her age because she didn't know her age. But he's just stressing. And from that perspective, we could say that it's not an outright lie. Okay, Rather, Hisham, uh, from a pious perspective, may be thinking, well, I want to stress the fact that my great aunt, and that's what she was, Aisha, was a was virgin uh, and was pure, and so she was younger than his other wives. He's on the young side of his wives. Okay, so let me pick the safest possible value that I can, and so he picks an extremely young age. And that's another point here: is the fact that a Muslim traditionist claimed that Aisha was this age shows that at that time there was no um, social disapproval of being married that young. So the argument that the Prophet was a pedophile based on the fact that he married a young girl, which he didn't, like I said, but even if he did, it's still not a strong argument because back then in the pre-modern world, and this was not just in you know, in the Islamic, early Islamic society, it was in all Near Eastern societies and in the wider, in the wider earth as well. I mean, people married very young back then, and there are several studies, and actually Dr. Little cites them in his study, that show that marriage at that time was nothing abnormal, and that's the reason why the traditionists attributed that age. They didn't see anything weird about that. Now, that, doesn't, that shouldn't be used as evidence that she was actually married at that age, only the fact that there was no reason for the traditionists not to attribute that age to her. The bottom line is, there's absolutely no reason for historical critical scholars to take these reports as being historically accurate. They have clear sectarian and political purposes behind them, and so we need to understand them in that vein.